Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Brave Files podcast. This is Heather Vickery. You know, there are moments in life where what we think we know breaks, and a new version of ourselves is revealed. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Mike Burton, who is the host of the Genuine Chit Chat podcast. Mike joins us to talk about the devastating loss of his father and how that loss helped him find himself, and it redefined who he wanted to be in the world. We talk about breaking through the armor that protects us when we're grieving and learning to truly experience life and grow. We also dive into how admitting you're wrong does not make you weak, the gift of asking for help, and how we're all flawed humans with unlimited potential. But before we start the show, let's practice that gift of asking for help. And I want to remind you that there is only one week left to call in with your gratitude for our annual gratitude episode. So I'm asking for your help in order to make this the most excellent episode possible. We need you to call in right now and share what you're most grateful for from the past year. So go ahead and pause the show and call us at 312-646-0205. And friends, it is so super easy. All you have to do is leave a voicemail. You know, sharing gratitude is like throwing happiness around like glitter. So help us spread that happiness and gratitude to everyone this Thanksgiving. Go ahead and give us a call right now. Honesty, resourcefulness, passion. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hi out there. How are my brave listeners today? Thank you so much for tuning in. You know, over the last year, we've talked a lot about grief, especially as it relates to losing a child. But we haven't spent much time on navigating life once you lose a parent. I'm very lucky I haven't lost any parents yet. And quite frankly, it's it's not something I really want to spend much time thinking about. But today's guest, Mike Burton, is here to share his personal journey through losing his father and how that changed the way he navigates his life. Mike is a buddy of mine, and he hosts the Genuine Chit Chat podcast. It's a really fun show, and you can check out my interview on that show. It's episode 54. It's called How to Be Brave, Not Fearless. So that title should interest you right there. Uh, Mike joins us all the way from Southampton, England, and I'm truly, truly delighted to welcome him to the show. Mike, hi. Hi. Hello there, Heather. It's great to finally be on your show after you came on mine. It was so much fun being on your show. And it's really, you do a fun job of genuine chit chat. It's a great (laughs) title. And while we were having that conversation, we struck up a conversation sort of about your personal life and, and the loss of your father. And I thought, gosh, that would be a great conversation to have on The Brave Files. So thank you for joining us. No worries at all. It was my pleasure. So... Can you tell us, give us a little background about your childhood and what your relationship was like with your dad as you were growing up? Yeah, sure. Um, So to preface this a little bit, I do have two um, older brothers that are half brothers. So my dad was married before uh, okay. divorce. I got married to my mum. So um, and my, my brothers are 17 and 21 years older than me, just well, to clarity. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So you can kind of tell already that my dad's a bit older. Um, so essentially, my childhood it was with just my mum and my dad. I was basically an only child, um, even though absolutely I didn't have background. Um, and you know, we used to go travelling quite a bit. But my dad loved and knowledge and things, and intelligence was one of the things that mattered most to him. So it was always going to museums. Um, he is a writer. He had written two books. Um, he was a songwriter. Tell, okay. Yeah, tell us about his books. What books did he write? <laughs> well, one of them is called The Hampshire Triangle, and I believe it was a sort of a crime thriller sort of thing. Um, and How the other fun. one, 
Yeah, well, the other one's more fun. The other one's called the pearl necklace, and it means exactly what you think it means. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, so, and it got written about in the local paper where the church um, basically banned it and came out and said, "This is disgusting. It's awful." Because it's not, unfortunately, a tiny bit graphic. There's a rape scene in front of a church. In oh. Local- Goodness. And, they and y'all it. cannot see me because this is audio, but I am <laughs> blushing from head to toe. If anybody listening does not know what Mike means, you can ask us privately, message Mike. Maybe you should ask Mike. Uh, we're yeah, going to give you his <laughs> contact information. Oh, boy. All right. Yeah. I, got, so I stepped right into it. I asked the title uh, of the yeah. book. So. Well, most of my auntie, who was uh, dad's sister, she read it and she said she couldn't get past like the first, no, the fifth page. <laughs> It was my mate read it and he said it was great but i haven't read it yet i'm just a bit like apparently it's, it's not it's it is about it's got a lot of sexual themes in it but it's not just a sex book it's not oh, like yeah. you know the podcast my dad wrote a porno it's not, it's not like that it's just <laughs> that's hilarious quite, yeah exactly um it's just got a racy uh crimey sort of book um sort of thing but yeah my dad was he was a man of many talents um he could also paint a little bit so he was quite artsy he was very knowledge based and my relationship with him I loved him to pieces and he was always trying to be the best for me. I mean, one of the things that really hit home, um, especially after he passed was he used to read newspaper articles and reviews and things about video games, but he didn't like video games, but he knew that I loved them. And he would occasionally just randomly give me, like, if I did really well in my grades at school or something, he would just bring me a video game and be like, look, I've heard really lots of great things about this and you like this game and this game. So I thought you'd like it. That's and he would spend, so like, sweet. Time. I know it's insane. And he like two of my favorite ever games, one is Smash Bros, who any nerds listen We'll know about that one. Um, and my other favorite game, uh, Star Wars The Force Unleashed, which I actually have a tattoo of. Um, both of those I'd never <laughs> heard of. And he actually bought them for me just off the cuff saying, oh, I know you like Star Wars or I know you like you know, Mario. Right. Because you he took the time to study and research things that mattered to you, even though he wasn't personally interested in them. Exactly. He always yeah. made that extra effort. And he always remembered that when he met new people, he'd always shake their hand and remember their name. He was, you know, he owned a business. So he, he ran his own business. So he was very good at interacting with people. He was very charismatic. But with me, the one thing I will say about him is I loved him to pieces and he was great in almost every way. But the biggest flaw with him is what that he could never admit he was wrong. Mm. And, and that was, that was the big thing, which kind of goes into the almost subject of this, of how men can't be vulnerable in a certain Absolutely. Way. Yeah. Um, so that, that's basically, I had a very close relationship with my dad. Um, so it was obviously really horrible when he passed, but it, it's, it's because I had my brothers and other things, it kind of it made it a little bit easier, but it's still obviously a very messy situation. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like he was very thoughtful. How did his inability to admit when he was wrong affect you? Can you admit when you're wrong? I can now, fortunately, and it's very, very often. So it's it's quite an easy thing to do. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> but when I was when I was younger, especially before Dad passed, I had a very similar thing to him, I, almost an ego in, in a sense. And it was just it was that weird thing of there's almost like a voice in my head saying, "If you're ever wrong, there's a voice in your head, even if you know you're wrong, telling you to not admit you're wrong." And unfortunately, I think I got that from Dad because he would never do it because it almost seemed like a sign of weakness when obviously it's not. Right, and it took it was around my sort of late teens uh, where I started kind of realizing it a bit more and dad passed away when I was 19. So from that point, that was obviously the almost coming of age. That was around the time people generally become sort of adults in a way. Uh, and it was around that time when I was kind of reflecting upon him and all the lessons he's taught me and things. I was like, being, excuse me, being wrong is, it's just everyone's wrong at some point. No one's right all the time. And, and it just took me a, a while to really go, you know, push the ego aside. If I'm wrong, I'll just hand up, put my hand up and say, look, I'm completely wrong about this. You know, yeah. I can have an argument with someone about 10 minutes and then we look it up and then I'm wrong. And I'm like, yep, yeah, it's fine. Okay, let's, yeah. learn. let's learn. It, it's so, it's the opposite. Admitting you're wrong doesn't show weakness, it shows strength. Uh-huh. Because we are always wrong uh, at some point or another. Uh, those of you, my mom, this is a long standing joke. My grandmother used to tell my mom, you will never ever admit when you're wrong. And my mom would say, if I were ever wrong, I would admit it. <laughs> that sounds like something my dad would say yeah exactly so, that so yeah but actually I think even she's outgrowing that a little bit but it's it's funny <laughs> I get that what about other things from your dad did you inherit that ability to remember people's names and their stories or to seek out things that they were interested in if you cared for people on the other end yeah well um that is definitely something I did pick up from my dad. Um, with people, I always try and make the effort because what, what I've realized a lot of the time is um, it works, especially in, in relationships, not just friendships, but also actual partner relationships, you know, not only the, the wrong thing, but the learning from people, it's, 
it's the little details. I found in my relationships, you know, if you do this big grandiose gesture, like we're going to Spain, it's like, okay, that's cool. That's nice. But it's, it's all the little things. It's just every day, you know, if your partner has a bad day or your friend has a bad day, you remember their favorite sweets and you just yeah. buy a pack. It's, yeah. it's all little things. And my dad was incredibly good at uh, meticulous, tiny details. A lot of time people wouldn't even notice. And I've got that a lot of just the, yeah, I really like it when, you know, you've got someone and they're just really down and you just, you, you are just buying something, you know, a little small thing. And so many people are so surprised when I do it, especially if they're just acquaintances and there's people I don't know that well. And mm-hmm. I'll just see something at I don't know, like a, a car boot sale or flea market. It's just, you know, go people selling random stuff. You buy a little trinket for a quid. You think, well, a quid in, it's a one pound. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got a lot of your listeners are uh, English, uh, American. So it's a quid. People are going to go, what the hell is that? No, it's um, one pound. Um, so it's just like, just something really cheap and you just get it for them on the off chance and the amount of times i've had people who i've had a couple of friends of mine who just got really teary and said you know i've been having a terrible day and this little thing has really brought it on and of course it's not about the thing it's about the thought exactly 100 percent. and that's a lot of what dab was about even though he obviously had his flaws it was he always meant well He, he was he was genuinely a really good person and that's always what he wanted to try and convey yeah absolutely do you think, so you were 19 when he passed. Um, how old are you now? I'm 25. Okay. So he's been gone for six years. Were you in, what were you doing at that time? Where were you in your life when he passed? Well, if I preface it a small amount of, it wasn't a uh, sudden death. It was, um, he passed away from cancer. So okay. he was ill. He was diagnosed about 18 months before. Um, and I'd say for the first year, you, you, you wouldn't have really even noticed. Like right. he was, he went for chemo. He got through it really well. He didn't really lose much of his hair. Um, so he, everything was generally fine on that end. And it's when it kind of was quiet for a bit, they said, oh, he may have a couple of years. He may not. We'll see. And then it just, a few months later, it kind of came back a bit more. It's and terrible. so- yeah, it's a horrible thing and it's just unfortunately kind of part of life. But um, he, when he got really started to get a lot more ill and things and I could see him slowly deteriorating more, it was, he was always trying to be optimistic about it, which is what I think kind of led him to not seem as bad as he was until mm. like the last month yeah. or two, I'd say. Um, but the, it was, I remember the moment it hurt me the most. Um, well, there's two moments I'll quickly say. The first moment is when he told me, because as I said, my dad never meets, he was wrong. Well, my dad, um, the only time he's ever apologized to me to obviously his entire life was when he told me he had cancer, which is not the time I want him to apologize to me. That's probably the one time in his entire life I didn't want him to apologize. Right, because he can't control that. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not his fault. He doesn't need to apologize. But that was, you know, and I saw sort of a vulnerability in, in him when he did that. So, and the other time was when he was really ill. Um, he passed away in, in May uh, 2013. And I think my it was like the 21st, I think. And, um, mum and dad's wedding anniversary was like really early May, I think it was, or, or late April or sort of time. And I just remember, um, he was in the, the lounge and obviously I was living at home at the time and things. And, um, he said to me, Oh, it's, it's, you know, your mum and I's but, uh, anniversary soon, but I'm too ill to go get her a card. Can you go get me one? And that was, Oh, that was horrendous. Then it, it really hit me. And I was just like, I can do it. Obviously I went to another shop and, and did it and stuff, but I was like, my dad, who's, you know, every morning he would get up and walk around the corner shop with me and get the papers and he'd sometimes just walk to work, take like 40 minutes. And he wasn't like a, a super fit guy, but he was definitely, he looked really good for his age. He, when he passed, he was 63. Um, everyone thought he was like late 40s, 50s sort of thing. So it was, it really hurt when it was, he's not only the vulnerability side, but actually seemingly physically weak. That was the most upsetting yeah. part. Yeah, that's definitely really hard to see people not, being themselves anymore and having exactly. to adjust to that. But there's also so much grace in, from my experience, in asking for help from the mm. people you love. Uh, it's also been my experience that people who struggle to admit when they're wrong really struggle to ask for help. Is 100%. that what did he have a hard time asking for help? Yeah. Well, I don't think he ever, my dad was quite a, uh, in, probably in his eyes, a successful individual. You know, mm. he, he once he got aside his own company, which is when I was about three or four, I think, um, from that point he had enough money and he, he, you know, he was, he never had to rely on anyone for money in that sense. He grew up in like a really poor family. And so since he was like, I think 14 or 15, he'd been working. So he's kind of like a self-made man in a right. sense. That's why. Love that. Yeah. It's, it's great. And it's very inspirational for me. And so, you know, he, he did all these things and he, I don't think he ever necessarily needed help. I mean, I think emotionally and things like that, he, I would say he probably did, but he didn't recognize that. So 
he, I don't think he, he was quite self-made. He would rather do something by himself for like two and a half hours than get someone else to help him and take 20 minutes. So it right. was a pride <laughs> thing. Very proud. Absolutely. Proud so asking you for help in that way was probably difficult for him, which is in turn maybe why it connected with you so deeply because you knew that that was hard. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So your father never heard your podcast, right? No, no. I started my podcast, uh, two and a half. Well, is it two years? Oh, no, it's two years ish now. Uh, I forget when I started exactly. It was like September, 2017, I think. So no, he, he never heard it. He never heard it. What do you think he'd think of it? I think he would love it because, um, essentially in, he was obviously, he had been in bands loads when he was um, younger, like uh, two months before he passed, he did a big charity gig, raising money for charity. And he was on stage with a neck brace and a crutch. Wow. Like, terminal they were like he's he's not gonna live that they was like flat out he's gonna die soon and he was on stage he got like everyone's friends and family and everyone he knew to he rented out this big place and raised loads of money for uh, Macmillan which is a cancer uh, charity Mm -hmm. in England and so he he was always very you know and he said he wrote the books and things like that so he was always creating stuff and in college I remember I started making music videos for local bands just as like a hobby and stuff and he loved it and he would tell everyone about it and all these sorts of other things and I had like a silly YouTube show with my friend uh, Reese as well. And whenever I was creating things like that, he'd always he'd get really excited about it. And he'd, he'd love me doing those sort of things. And he always loved listening to the radio and it was very musical and he like, listened to interviews and things like that. And he was, he was a man of knowledge. He, he just knew a little bit about everything. And that's almost the, the sort of guide of, of my podcast is just I like everything quite a bit. So it's just like <laughs> finger in many pies. So I think he would be incredibly proud. And that's kind of, you know, I don't necessarily believe in a life after death, but if I did, I'd like to think that he would see on and be really proud. Yeah. If you could say anything to him, what would you say? Um, I'd probably thank him, to be honest. Uh, it would depend how long I had. If I had five <laughs> minutes, I would thank him. If I had two hours, I would thank him and then be like, why did you never admit you're wrong? Come on. <laughs> like, where was that? Like, I'd love to get into his mind and ask him, like, flat out in front of him, you know? So that one really has stuck with you the most. Do you think that's because that is the one thing that most informed how you moved through your life and the decisions you made and, and maybe got in your way the most? Yeah, I I realized uh, mainly after dad passed that the biggest issues in my life came from me, essentially, like reasons that I either had trouble in relationships or friendships, people, you know, uh, in my mind being uh, awful to me. And I couldn't quite compute why that was. And when I had that realization, I was, it kind of, it was like a moment of clarity and it was like a weight, it got lifted off my shoulders. And, you know, it obviously it sounds mean almost, you know, I don't like to, you know, people say don't talk about the dead, but like, I like to try and keep a balanced approach to it of like, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to never, I'm not going to say my dad was a saint because he wasn't, but he was a lovely guy. But that part of him is the thing that annoys me the most. And we used to get into arguments, you know, I was an argumentative child and I was a know-it-all and he was a know-it-all. So we have two know-it-alls who are loud mouthed arguing with each other. <laughs> they can't be wrong. And it, oh. and it was like, if he had a little bit more uh, introspection in that regard, I think he could have guided me a bit more and maybe I wouldn't have been such essentially a dick to people <laughs> for so long without, you know, kind of reading it back. With that learned behavior. Do you think one day you may have your own children, Mike? Um, yeah, I, it's, it's funny you said that because before my dad passed, I was like, yeah, but, you know, I kind of would probably want to at some point. Uh, and then once he passed away, obviously, uh, for people who have had someone who's like a family member who they're close to, uh, pass away, when it's, it's obviously every, whoever dies connected to you is different. If you have partners dying or children dying, God forbid, or anything like that, it's almost like a hole in the puzzle. And you always would like to expect your parents to die before you. You know, it's, it's a horrible thing to think about, but this hopefully how it's going to go. Right. The circle of life. Uh, sure. Exactly. Yeah. But when, when it's gone, nothing can fully replace that, you yeah. know, it, and it's this weird void. And so once that had gone, I kind of, I felt like not quite the void could be filled by having a child. I don't have kids now. I didn't just suddenly go out and have a kid. But um, <laughs> that would be strange, wouldn't it? My dad's past us, just replace it. No, but parts in my mind would, you know, I'd be a lot more willing to want to have that family connection because, you know, what I didn't have as a dad um, from, you know, 19 onwards, it's now kind of made me go, you know, I want to be there for a child. Yeah. I want to, you know, be the best dad I can be. And also, in all honesty, my dad, the, the, as I said, the only real flaw he had was not admit he was wrong. We get into arguments sometimes. But if I was, you know, as good as dad was at being a parent, then I would be very, very happy with that. Yeah. And 
you know so much more. That's the thing about parenting. You know, my mom, I know, has sort of taken offense to choices that I've made are a little different than hers. Well, I didn't do that and you were fine or I did do that and you were fine. But of course, we grow and we learn. And so now you've had this opportunity to learn that you are human, you do make mistakes. And then for your future children to be able to say to them, you're going to make mistakes and that's going to be okay. So now you can still take all of these lessons from your dad and employ them with mm. your own children one day, should you have them? Well, yeah, exactly. And it was a weird thing I was thinking about um, a while ago. You know, you get that sort of idea in your head, like, oh, if I could travel back in time and I could, you know, stop him from dying or I could get him diagnosed earlier or something, would I do it? And it's a really, it's a really weird thing to think about because, and, you know, it's like, oh, I could have my dad back. But I, I've said it uh, previously uh, in, in my podcast and to people I know, it's like my dad dying was the worst thing that's ever happened to me, but it's the best thing that's ever happened to my character because I've learned, like it's a crash course in learning. You know, you really, uh, when my dad passed away as well, I was living with mum and obviously dad at the time. Dad passed, so I had to help my mum. Yeah. And I love my mum to pieces. She's amazing. But she was not very good at dealing with her grief and letting me deal with mine. So I was having to balance out my own grief while trying to balance out my mum's grief. You know, yeah. I was 19 here. I could hear my mum crying like for like a week after he passed in, at, at night. So sure. all this weight on me. Um, and you know, I had my two brothers and you know, they had their respective families and things and my friends were really good to me, but they can't understand. And it's not, you know, it's not their fault. Obviously it's just a part of what happens. And it's, it's a really weird place to be in because I had to grow up really quickly yeah. because my, you know, my mum also wanted to move out the, ha the family house we'd been in for 15 plus years. So she wanted to move somewhere else, which meant I had to move out. So yeah. with it, you know, a year and a half of dad passing, uh, you know, I had to grow up, figure out what I was going to do. The, the year my dad passed away was the year um, I basically got a proper full-time job, like a proper career. So from before dad to after dad, I'd moved out. I had a full career. Um, I got a, like a proper girlfriend, like all these things. So I just had to grow up really, really quickly. So I, I feel like it's, it's a really mean thing to say, but if I could go back in time and, and almost save him, I, I don't, I don't know if I would, you know, and it's a, it's a really sure. horrible, conflicting feeling in a sense. I I understand that. Uh, I'm sure that it is incredibly conflicting, but we are who we are because of what we've been through. That's yeah. just f true for all of us, right? And going back and, and wishing it were different would change the outcome. So if mm. you're good with who you are and where you are, then I understand not wanting yeah. to have to shift that. Can you tell us a little bit about your grief process yes um so um, essentially what happened was you know my dad just as a brief of the day that it happened you know the the moment in my life that i'm most happy happened is the morning my of the day that my dad passed away i was going to uh going to work and i was running really late and stuff so i was rushing about the house and mum said right go go speak to your dad um you know, just go talk to him and i was like well i'm running really late can i just talk to him later and she was like no no go talk to him. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. So I went and spoke to him and I can't remember the whole conversation, but I remember it ending with him saying that he loved me and he gave hugs a lot, but he didn't say that he loved you all the time. Like he said it, but it wasn't, you know, I say it much more than like, to my mates and stuff that he, he does things. And, um, so he'd say on the odd occasion that he loved me, but, um, you know, he said that he loved me and I said that I loved him and he said he was proud of me. And mm -hmm. then that was the last time I ever saw him alive. So, Technically, because I then after that he got put into a hospice, and then him moving him from my house at the upstairs um, all the way to the hospice, it it messes insides up quite a bit, and he passed away that night in the hospice. And I went and saw him when he was like basically out of it. His body was still right, alive, but right. essentially not responsive. And then we left. Mum stayed for a bit, and then two hours later, I got the phone call and went and, you know saw him. And obviously, my grief process from that because I had the the 18 months leading up to that, I I felt at the time that I sort of almost dealt with it in a way because it was almost like he's already he's almost already gone in the last yeah. two months where he was on so much medication. He wasn't as sharp as he was. He kept forgetting things. And that was really odd to see because my dad never liked that. Even if he was quite drunk, he was still on the ball. <laughs> um, but it, the grieving process, it was very strange because I think I just distracted myself quite a lot. Um, with a lot of things. I mean, the girl I was dating at the time, uh, my friends would call her many names, so I would just put it as difficult. <laughs> oh. uh, so I had that on my plate, uh, as well as, you know, the thing with my mum and having to move out. So I kind of, I distracted myself a lot and I thought I did it in a healthy way, but, but now sort of looking back on it, 
I was eating terribly. I was drinking loads, like every opportunity. I was going out and getting yeah. really, really drunk. And I, I didn't, I didn't really connect it. But it was like, you know, that was, it became almost the only thing I was looking forward to a lot of the time, which was just getting, you know, it wasn't every night of the week or anything, but it was once the weekend, because I had to drive to work quite a lot, so I would never drink of the week. But on the weekend, as soon as it hits Friday, it would just be loaded one for the races, just all the weekend. And I wouldn't really do much. Yeah. And so it was, it was basically self-medication. And I didn't realize that until I think it's about two or so years afterwards. Like I, I was only doing that for six, I'd say six months to a year or so. Uh, and I put on a bit of weight and things like that, but it was, everyone was like, oh, it's about the grieving process and things. And I just think I didn't, I didn't process it properly. Like for example, I didn't actually cry until six months after my dad yeah. passed away, which is, you know, I've, I've never been a huge crier anyway, but that is a, a long time. It is. So I just hadn't, I processed it, but I was such, I was trying to kind of almost be so busy in the week, you know, my job, my girlfriend, et cetera, that I was trying to kind of just be an adult immediately and kind of get through it. And then, yeah, I had a conversation um, with my girlfriend at the time in the car and it just hit me and it, it just, it broke me down from there. And now I'm really open and honest with it, but it took me a while. Was it that moment that sort of shifted you out of the self-medicating denial phase into the time to deal with this phase? Yeah, I would say it was not like an immediate snap of the fingers thing, but I think after, because I I didn't really realize this until I I had cried at that point, but it was almost like, it was like a build up of pressure almost within you. And then sometimes just having a cry and being purely 100% emotionally vulnerable, it, it releases the pressure and it, it's just, you know, it, it, your shoulders finally shrug and it's just like a big exhale for almost yeah. your soul. And I, from that point and how I felt afterwards, I realized that I had actually been holding it back. And, you know, I'd been trying to, trying to almost to prove to everyone that I was such a strong young man that I could deal with everything fine, that I didn't need to cry. I didn't need to show people that this has really bothered me and stuff. Like a lot of people, some who really close to me were saying like, you could almost not have told that my dad had passed away right. because I was acting so not differently about it. And I think that that was part of the problem was I was just kind of always kind of going, yeah, he's gone. It, it sucks, but I kind of dealt with it. So it's fine. Yeah. And just, and I never dug deep, you know? So I felt like I did. And I think it's interesting that you say that because nearly every conversation I've had with you, and we've had several, not just the, <laughs> the interviews, the loss of your father's come up. Mm. So I know that it is probably the single most impactful thing that's happened to you in your life. I don't want to put words yeah. in your mouth. Would you say that? No. Is that accurate? hundred percent. Yeah. I'd say it's like an anchor point. In yeah. A, in a sense. Yeah. So, uh, what a tremendous amount of growth. I mean, you said it, you said you grew up I mean, be, becoming, going from being a young man to being a, a full grown man to, um, admitting these things that are hard and difficult and, having real feelings and putting them out there for people to potentially support you or judge you or whatever, whatever the reasons are that we don't share hurt and sadness and grief, probably the fear of rejection. I I imagine. Yeah. Well, with me, I think it was uh, an ego thing primarily, which was almost, it's not so stupid to saying it now. And I guess it kind of was because I was, I was essentially still just a teenager in a way, but it was that, that mindset of thinking I was still a bit above everyone. Like mm. I was a little bit smarter than everyone, even if, you know, I could always make an excuse for myself. You know, <laughs> that oh, may just get... be a teenager thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was probably a combination. But like when I was young, I was kind of like a, I was overachiever, but I never really tried that hard. And the problem is that gave me a bad mindset, you know, and my dad being who he was, and I was quite intelligent, which didn't help. So the problem is I would be a smart ass no or and I'd think I'm smarter than everyone. I'd argue with teachers and things because I thought I was so much smarter than they were. And then, you know, all my friends would get, you know, uh, really upset about, X, Y, Z. And I'd be like, well, you know, I don't even get upset about my dad dying. Like I wouldn't say mm-hmm. that, but it's that it's kind point of, of pride. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, well, I'm smarter than everyone. I'm more emotionally stable than everyone. I'm just above. And dad dying and me really actually coming to terms with that, it almost uh, was a visual way of thinking of it. It's almost like stripped away the knight's armor in a sense to reveal just a boy in knight's armor. Yeah. Like and that's kind of how it was. And it took, and once I was out the armor, then I could you know, see the sunlight breathe and experience life and actually grow. So I, it, it was like a weird yeah, yeah. vulnerability shield. It's a beautiful arc there though. Um, during a, for a sad situation, as you move through your life every day, your podcast, your regular job, your friendships and relationships, 
how do you honor your father? How do you stay connected to him? Um, well, one thing which I will say to anyone who uh, anyone who knows anyone who's had someone close to them pass away will probably know this feeling, which is you. As I'm obviously getting older, I am my father's son, so there's certain a lot of movies. Like he got me into quite a few movies. He was a lover of huge, huge lover of music. You know, David Bowie, Genesis, uh, all these sorts of things, and. I listen to a lot of music and stuff now and movies, et cetera. And the thing that gets me is when it's, I, I like, oh, yeah, dad would love this. And then it's like, oh, he can't. Yeah. So, but I, I am here, not just me solely because I've got the two brothers, but like I am his legacy in a yeah. way. So, you know, me, when I talk about him, because um, in the, my podcast, I did a whole episode where me and my brother just spoke about him truthfully and honestly and things. And it's just, uh, Living, doing my podcast is my art form of releasing into the world, like he had with his music and he had with yeah. his books and things. And when I hear music that I think he would love, I'll give it an extra couple of listens and stuff. And I'll, I'll give it. And, and one big thing that really hit home with me was um, obviously David Bowie. He passed away of cancer. Yeah. He yeah. wrote an album about it called Black Star. And that happened only, it was quite shortly after dad passed. And Bowie was one of dad's all time favorites. I remember listening to the changes and the, uh, all these sorts of other songs in Life on Mars, etc. I'm in the car with him and stuff when I was younger. And listening to that album, it kind of was like the the, fi- the final sort of nail in the coffin of like, he's no longer here, but everything he likes still is. Yeah. And so I've been trying to, um, one of the things my dad that I, as well is he loved musicals, whereas I never did. I, I've, I've not been a fan of musicals. Um, I'm a big fan. Everyone knows <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> well, my girlfriend's a big fan of musicals. And so what I did is I... Um, uh, when I started dating her, she was like, oh, maybe she can get musicals a go. And now we've seen, I took her to see Wicked. She took me to see Book of Mormon, which was phenomenal. Absolutely uh, hilarious. Yep. Yeah. It's one of the best. Uh, and we're going to go see Avenue Q uh, as well uh, in the coming months. So I tried, Wicked was one of his all time favorites. I think West Side Story was his favorite. And so obviously, as you can tell, I remember the little piece of detail yeah. that I, about my dad as well. So I try and like the things that he likes to expand my mind and interest exactly yeah. you know i listen to certain songs and think of him it's interesting you say that and that you bring up musicals my nine-year-old was in the lion king jr this summer so it's a musical and the song that she sang she played rafiki so i don't know if you're familiar with the lion king movie or not perhaps I'm not fairly, i'm fairly but it's rafiki the baboon yes yes yeah. and her solo song was he lives in you and she's singing it to Simba about his father, Mufasa. Did I say that right? Mufasa? Mufasa. 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 Yeah. Right? <laughs> Where he said, my father's dead. And she said, no, you're wrong. He lives in you. Hmm. Look at yourself. And he lives in you. And so I thought that was a nice little tie in there. Um, I love that. I think it's great. Stay connected and open your mind. I like that you said that. I open my mind in ways that he used to do, that he taught Mm -hmm. you to do, uh, which is really lovely. So I know you're a regular listener of this show. Thank you for that. (laughs) So I want to know, because you've heard me talk about it a million times, how do you bring gratitude in your life? Do you have a gratitude practice? Um, Kind of. I don't have a sort of a written one uh, per se, Um, but what I do is... Uh, you know, I, I drive to work. It takes me 40 minutes to an hour each, each day. So I have a lot of time to, yeah. So I have, a, sometimes there's no traffic. It takes about 25 minutes, which is even more annoying, but um, I can't complain too much. My girlfriend takes an hour plus. So I can't complain about my commute to her. Um, but what I think, I've still listened to podcasts, quite a lot of music and that sort of thing. But sometimes I'll just, it, I used to always listen to stuff in the shower. So I think like shower is now the time where I don't listen to anything nice. because I need to kind of give myself some time. And I normally... I kind of process everything and I try and put everything into the right perspective, you know, yeah. and I know a lot of, I've got quite a few friends who have got, uh, mental issues or I've, I've got a few friends who've got like abusive parents or mm-hmm. these sorts of mm-hmm. darker edges of, of the world in a sense. And I kind of, one way I try to be grateful is I try and use the, essentially the privilege that I've had to assist others. That's mm-hmm. kind of how I try and do it in a way. It, it's, I think about it a lot and I just think, you know, I've got uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's, you know, she's a single mom. She hasn't got a, a lot of money or anything like that. And I see her like once a month and I'll buy us dinner and we just hang out and things. And occasionally, you know, um, we'll have some drinks and I won't, I'll just buy it for both of us and then she won't pay me back. So, and I'll just be like, don't worry about it. And those, those little things of mm-hmm. just because I can afford an extra 
10 pounds or whatever for her is a much bigger deal. Right. And I, I try and look at everyone as a perspective of you don't know what people are going through. Right. And from that time where my dad passed, no one, unless I told people, no one had any idea yeah. because I wasn't grieving in the, in the sort of conventional way. So what I, I try and be grateful by seeing what I have because of, you know, my, my dad worked a lot and he gave me, um, when he passed, there's some money for me um, in savings. And so when my car first I ex- basically just blew up, it didn't literally explode, but you know, it died. So I had to buy a new one. I, I had the funds because of my dad working hard and saving right. up and having this little nest egg for me. I had the funds for that. And, because of these little things, and I, you know, I both my parents together until obviously dad passed when I was 19. I have traveled uh, quite a lot around Europe because of that. I've had a lot of step ups from people that obviously even in just the Western world, we didn't even talk about third world countries or anything, but like around people I associate myself with and friends, there's a lot of fingers and experiences that I've done or had or whatever that they haven't because they weren't given the step up in life that I yeah. kind of was. Yeah. So it's a lot to I, be grateful for. Well, that's the thing. And I try not to, I try not to let my ego run things. I mean, I do argue with people sometimes and think I'm smarter than them. So I can't, I'm not perfect. But I, I try and look at myself and just anything I have more than someone else, I try and think, okay, why have I got that? Uh, is it because I've actually genuinely worked harder or is it because I've actually kind of been a bit lucky? And that's one thing that I find that with certain people with certain mindsets, they are quite... They're like, I worked hard and I earned loads of money and therefore I am better than everyone. And it's, it's, it's not always that simple. No, it, no, it's not. I mean, knowing you as well as I do, I wonder if you're willing to, to try because all of that is a beautiful way to practice gratitude, but it's more than that. It's more yeah. than um, being grateful for what you have that others don't, but even being grateful for what you have that others do have and sharing that with mm. them. So if you ever want to try journaling, I can get you a copy of my gratitude journal because it's a beautiful book and it really does help connect you with all of the little things in life that actually turn out to be the, the big things. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm always, I'm open minded. I'm always willing to try things. I mean, I started doing meditation the last year or so. There so. you go. This is very yeah. similar to that. <coughs> and I'd be curious to see um, what kind of impact it has. I think you'd like it. I really do. Yeah, I'd hundred percent give that a go. That sounds great. All right. Well, we can make that happen. If you guys <laughs> out there listening are interested, are you, are you journaling? Are you, are you keeping track of gratitude? Pop on over the website and get your own copy of the journal because it's awesome. So Mike, <laughs> as we come to the end of this interview, which I really appreciate your honesty and in taking us through this journey for you. I get to ask a question that is so deep and, and important to me from a moral and value standpoint. What is your favorite charitable organization to support? Um, well, this one, it probably won't translate quite as well for a lot of your listeners, um, but it's it's a very, very local one to me. Um, as you said, I live in Southampton in England, and um, that's in the county of Hampshire. Um, and it's called the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance. And I donate to it every month. And essentially, it's just, it, it's a helicopter that goes around and basically saves people when they're in really horrible situations. I love that. Yeah. I mean, so not that there are horrible situations, but that a helicopter <laughs> goes around and saves people. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not necessarily one that, you know, I wouldn't expect anyone in America to donate to, you know, some little uh, little place down here, but it's one that it came, they basically came to my door one day and this guy and he was talking about it. And I was like, you know, it's a, almost a selfish way to think about charity. And I it almost begrudge saying it out loud, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to be honest. It's almost like, well, if I donate to this, someone I know or care about could be saved from it. And Absolutely. It, it, obviously charity should be about, you know, just selflessly giving and not thinking about oneself. But of all the different charities and things, I know there are countless ones that are pure and do really, really good work. But that was one which, without me really having to think, I was like, you know, it's not this giant multinational charity that may be putting money elsewhere. It, it's literally, you give them money and they fly a helicopter that I often conceive just you know, around. So I know it's working. Yeah. You don't have to feel guilty for supporting a charity that you can see the results of, Hmm. right? Each of us are created differently. The things that motivate us and make us connected and feel passionate are all different. And thank goodness for that. There are people who want to support, you know, fresh water in third world countries and, and they don't necessarily see that directly, but it's, it's okay. It's wonderful that everybody has a different charity that they connect with and a different way to support their community or communities in the world at large. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's lovely. Thank you. Mike, would you share your three words with us one last time? Honesty, resourcefulness, passion. 
So I think those are great words. You are definitely honest, and I have found you to be very resourceful and passionate. So uh, I appreciate very much that you've come on to share this journey with us, which it sounds like from everything that you've told us, uh, we're going from pretending nothing was wrong and that your father wasn't sick and that he didn't pass to asking to, to share your story for other people to hear and really bringing it to life in that way um, is just tremendous growth and a gift for everybody who's listening. You know, women are so much more often encouraged to talk about loss and grief than men are. And everyone out there that's listening and, and Mike, it's so important for everyone to know that your feelings matter to gain the proper skills to move through grief. We have this wonderful episode um, Mike, I'm curious if you've listened to it with uh, Elua Arthur, the death doula. I believe it's episode 40. No, I listened to Tattoo Tom that talks about grief in a different way. Tattoo Tattoo Tom is my hero, but you should check out (laughs) Elua's, it's called Death Brought Me Back to Life. And so, but you know, the gifts that we can give to other people to know um, you're entitled to your feelings, you're entitled to be sad or happy or angry or all of those things and how to deal with grief and to move through it. So thank you so much for taking the time to share all of your journey here with us. No worries. So thank you so much for having me on a great fan and love to be on the show again. Thank <laughs> you so much. Yeah. Won't now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. I hope that whatever you are going through in your life, you're choosing to deal with it bravely, right? That doesn't mean you're not scared. It doesn't mean there's no fear attached to it, but face it and grow from it. I'm here to remind you today and always to go out and choose bravely. And if you love the show, I hope you will subscribe, rate, and review and share it with a friend so that we can keep continuing to grow the audience and do this work that we're doing. So this is Heather Vickery reminding you today and always to choose bravely. Today's show was brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash the brave files and browse their unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title of your choice for free and start listening. It's that simple. Just head to audiotrial.com slash The Brave Files. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, or get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we'd love to know what you think. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music is produced by Matt Lewis. Follow him on Instagram at mattmmusic or visit his website, theunionband.com. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to our associate producer, Kim Statler. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week.